if it isn't already clear after two of these videos, the reason I like pointing out scientific inaccuracies in cinema is not because I want to deride the movies, but rather I simply want to use movies as a jumping off point for a discussion about science. Even the most scientifically inaccurate films give us fantastic visual references that we can then compare to real life in order to gain invaluable real world context. That thing does not obey the laws of physics at all. Because you can only get so much from textbook diagrams. As such, I have nothing but thanks for even the most egregious, well, okay, for everything but the most egregious scientific claptrap that Hollywood puts out. So with that said, let's get to getting it. Number four, saving someone from a huge fall by catching them at the last second. Easy, miss. I've got you. You, you've got me. Who's got you? I certainly get why movies do this. It's dramatic, or at least it was dramatic before it became a total cliche. But is it possible to save someone like this? Let's look at the physics. Terminal velocity is the maximum speed at which a given object falls through a given medium. The terminal velocity of a human is approximately 122 miles per hour. You can increase your speed by pointing yourself like an arrow or by jumping from a much higher altitude, where the air is thinner, but most people in the movies are falling from no more than the height of a building, with all the grace of a sack of potatoes. So 122 miles per hour is a good figure for our purposes. At those speeds, Batman's arm would get pulled right out of its socket or more likely, his grip would fail him. Lois Lane would splatter against Superman's indestructible ribcage. At terminal velocity, even landing in water is like landing on concrete, because water isn't compressible. That's why belly flops hurt so much. At those speeds, you need one hell of a cushion to survive. Take a look at this scene from the Chronicles of Riddick Escape from Butcher Bay, which gets it gloriously half right. It's a sudden stop at the bottom. Great line, great scene, great game. And while I can appreciate the nod towards actual physics here, I can't imagine that using a human body as an airbag would do too much to prevent injury. A few films get most everything right though, most notably Spider-Man. In this scene, Spider-Man jumps from a building and grabs hold of Mary Jane, which works out fine because they're traveling at about the same speed when they make contact, and then the stretchiness of his webbing slows their descent like a bungee cord, rather than stopping them instantly. So both of them survive. And for all the things that The Amazing Spider-Man 2 got wrong, we can at least give it credit for accurately depicting the effects of a sudden stop from a great height on the human body. Spoiler alert. And although I haven't seen Assassin's Creed at the time of this filming, I noticed in one of the trailers that Michael Fassbender throws a knife into some water before he hits it thereby breaking the surface tension and decreasing his likelihood of getting injured. Good one there. Number three, ignoring the law of conservation of momentum. Hold on! Everybody loves talking about the law of conservation of matter and energy, but what about momentum? Generally speaking, I like the finest hours, but it was all too easy to tell which parts of the real life story they were embellishing. I read conflicting accounts online as to whether or not the ship actually ran aground while it was still being crewed, but if it did, it certainly wouldn't have looked this pleasant. But why shouldn't it look this pleasant? They're only going 5-10 miles an hour, right? Well, the ship's speed might only be 10 miles per hour, but its momentum is enormous, owing to the sizable mass of the ship. I'm no physicist, I wouldn't know how to calculate the exact numbers, but the general gist is that a tanker's stern traveling at 10 miles per hour would generate the same amount of energy as a car traveling at many hundreds of miles per hour. It gets even worse when you look at things with greater mass traveling at greater speeds, like, say, light speed? Objects in zero gravity don't have weight, but they do have mass. Accelerating or decelerating to or from light speed in mere seconds would throw everything in a spaceship against the nearest bulkhead. At 
at light speed, which is, of course, not survivable. Who gets this right? None other than the Animorph series. Hell yeah! It might be a bit of sci-fi expositional gobbledygook, but author K.A. Applegate does well to write in a line about how ships are equipped with compensators to protect their occupants from sudden acceleration changes. Yerk and Andalite ships are also notably not capable of traveling more than one-tenth the speed of light. And when they do need to get to distant parts of the galaxy in a hurry, they travel through Z-space, at conventional rocket speeds, rather than light speed. Speaking of light speed, number two, light speed. Or more specifically, unregulated light speed. Okay, my beef with light speed is not that it exists. After all, the math doesn't say that light speed is impossible, the math merely states that you'd need an infinite amount of energy in order to accelerate anything up to the speed of light. Movies can easily get around this by saying that ships are actually tunneling through wormholes or folding space-time or hell. Maybe they have discovered an infinite source of energy which allows them to accelerate up to the speed of light and it just breaks down a lot. Point is, I accept that light speed is possible in many a fictional universe. I accept that. My real beef here is in any fictional universe in which light speed privileges go unregulated. Because anything moving close to the speed of light is basically just a hydrogen bomb with seatbelts. If the Millennium Falcon collided with anything while traveling at or near the speed of light, everyone would be in trouble. To its credit, Star Wars A New Hope does make this explicitly clear. Traveling through hyperspace in like dust and crops, boy. Without precise calculations, we'd fly right through a star or bounce too close to a supernova and then it your trip real quick, wouldn't it? But the thing is, when traveling at light speed, you'd have to avoid more than just stars and planets. At that speed, Colliding with anything bigger than a golf ball would be enough to set off a nuclear reaction. That's why when some sci-fi films go so far as to warp their ships into the middle of a battle or into the atmosphere of a planet, I laugh. You wouldn't just be destroying your ship if you did that, you'd be nuking your destination. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. Now, with a lot of regulation, maybe you could come up with some feasible safety precautions. But the idea of giving every junker in the galaxy a warp drive sounds only about as advisable as giving every Pinto a uranium-powered engine. What a piece of junk! Number one, incorrect raptor wrist anatomy. God, finally someone's taking this one on, right? I know this one sounds super pedantic and nitpicky, but stick with me and I promise I'll make this interesting. I give the Jurassic Park franchise a lot of leeway when it comes to scientific inaccuracies, because the dinosaurs in these films are actually genetic amalgamations. So it's perfectly fine by me if the raptors are oversized, featherless, hyperbolically intelligent, and way too fast. But one thing I think the filmmakers would do well to correct, mostly because it would have no effect on the resulting story, is raptor wrist anatomy. See. Theropods like Velociraptor couldn't pronate the wrists like we can. They couldn't form the so-called bunny pose. If you see a mounted skeleton in this position, it's because the museum curators have actually swapped the ulna and radius so as to conform to visitor expectations. Theropod palms always faced inward like they were holding a basketball. Why should you care? Why should anyone care? Because raptor wrist anatomy is one of the many features that paleontologists have identified which indicates the direct evolutionary lineage of the birds. Birds can't pronate their wrists either. Take a look at any chicken wing and you'll see that this is an important component of wing anatomy, which raptors share. As such, I believe this anatomical detail should be featured prominently, or at least accurately, in what is still the only movie franchise that is apparently allowed to feature dinosaurs. Congratulations, Jurassic World. You made dinosaurs boring in a movie about people trying to fix boring dinosaurs. Maybe before you fix the science, you should fix the script. 